Well, hello and welcome to our Changing Homes webinar. I'm Nicole and I'm a Family Counsellor for the Family Relationship Services. Hello and welcome. My name is Wayne. I'm a Family Mediator at the Family Relationship Services. This webinar is an opportunity for us to provide some general information that we believe will be helpful and relevant to most people who are engaged in one or more of our programs. We acknowledge that some of the information may not be relevant or new to you, but even so, we hope that it will be a timely reminder and some reassurance to know that both yourself and the other party will be watching this webinar and will receive the same information. We would also like to acknowledge that some of the content may be upsetting um, to, to certain people for various reasons. So if you have any questions or concerns that arise out of watching the webinar, we invite you to contact your practitioner. We would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. So these are the topics that we will cover. So a little on what we know, looking after your health and wellbeing, importantly, some information around conflict and family violence, some information on communication and parenting styles and blended families, um, developmental ages and stages of children, a little on family law. We'll talk about the programs that the Family Relationship Services offers and some future considerations. So what we know is children survive and thrive post-parental separation. Approximately one in five children experience parental separation by the time they reach the age of 18, and that equates to around 50 to 60,000 children per year in Australia. Approximately 30% of parents post-separation will manage to reach agreement without any outside assistance. They can work it out between themselves and go on and co-parent successfully. Another 30% of separated parents uh, will seek some assistance from their lawyers, psychologists, and family counsellors, and once again, go on and co-parent successfully. And the remaining 40% tend to have a disagreement there for whatever reason, unable to resolve. And this is a group that we tend to see mostly at the Family Relationship Services. For those parents that come for mediation, and it's around about two thirds of them manage to reach a parenting agreement or a parenting plan, and the remaining third usually progress to family court. Very important thing to remember here is that it's the conflict, not the parental separation, which accounts for the problems that children's experience. And the strongest predictor of poor child separation, poor child adjustment after separation is a parental conflict. Poor long-term outcomes occur when parental conflict is high, for example, verbal abuse or physical violence and when it's frequent. We often use the cycle of loss and grief when we're talking about separation. Whilst this slide that you see is not relevant to all parents, what you can see is on the top of the screen there is person A and just below it is person B. Person A is the person that uh, instigated the separation and you can see by the very steep emotional lines there that they go through their frustration and, and sadness um, prior to the separation and they get to the point where they actually feel relief that I've made a decision that it's best for both of us and for our children's sake for us to separate. And when you look at the, uh, the part just below that, you'll see that person B is quite often going along merrily happily or sometimes in a bit of confusion as to what's happening with the other parent. And then when the separation comes along, that is when they experience these uh, severe um, ups and downs in their emotions. You know, they go quite often to a state of shock, uh, denial, like why is this happening to me? This doesn't happen to me, this sort of thing. It's for other people. Um, frequently, unfortunately, uh, people can um, become quite angry. And this is a time of uh, where family violence can escalate. And then people do naturally feel quite sad for the loss of their relationship. But over time, all the uh, literature shows us that most parents are able to move on and um, you know, go on to lead a happy life and co-parent successfully. 
And when parents come to mediation or counselling for us, um, you know, they can in, engage in joint sessions with our counsellors and with our mediators. And uh, that is where we can offer support and, and guidance to assist them in co-parenting in, well into the future. So just think about where you are currently and have a really good think about where you think the other parent may be. So looking after your health and wellbeing in general is only is not only important for you, but also for your children that are depending on you. So it's important to role model healthy coping techniques for your children. So as we can see on the screen, these may include exercising, which is good getting those um, endorphins going in your body that help you to feel good, to help you to feel better. Eating healthy, relaxing, so just taking some, some time out, um, spend time with your children, um, you know, just slowing things down a little. And socialising with friends and family is a good way of doing that. That's not only good for you, it's also good for your children to, to keep those contacts up with, with friends and, and family. And also, you know, there's no shame in reaching out for professional support. If you're feeling really sad all the time or, or really angry, or you just feel that, that you're just not coping, you know, reach out, get yourself into a good place. When we see parents in a good place, um, then generally their children are too. We're, go we're going to look at a, a video um, that was published by Anglicare in South Australia, and it provides stories and perspectives of real clients who participated in the Kids Are First program. It's a post-separation support program for parents and children. It's so very similar to our Parenting Orders program, which I'll talk to you about later on. I don't know how many times I gave, I would handed over my daughter to my ex-husband, or my, my um, um, at the time, and then had to physically restrain her into the car seat. Yeah, um, because that um, I didn't know whether he would actually bring them back or not. Yeah, there were lots of um, lots of challenges to overcome. There were lots of emotional challenges and lots of um, emotions that were tied to that. We started to discuss custody arrangements and things like that, and the emotions came in, and um, it was tough going. Within a month, it was a nightmare, and all hell broke loose, and uh, he took my three boys, and I did a recovery order to get them back. devastating experience and um, you desperately want it to be different and try or I tried so many things to try and make it different. We wanted to ensure that we were doing the right thing you know we in some areas we weren't communicating correctly I mean we we weren't yelling and screaming at each other but we certainly weren't communicating. While the children seemed robust and happy at school um, at night time they would come into bed with me every night um, because they needed the security and they would just feel so confused about the situation.
Things went quite smoothly up until he started kindy, when we started to have a few disagreements about how long he was spending um, at different homes. It was coming to an extent that we could no longer actually do an exchange from a door to door. Uh, we, you know, tried uh, in a in a neutral location, and it it, it went from bad to worst as we would as two people trying to f uh, fix, um, I guess, their own problems in two different directions. The children were being affected and I wanted it to be different desperately. Who's really important here and who's got to deal with it as well is the other, you know, the other three people outside the agreement that, that don't have anything, uh, any control over what's going to happen to them. There was a final event where um, uh, I had tried to say no, the children are with me and he had come and found me in the car and said they're with me and he grabbed them and put them in the car and I was crying and I realised that I just got to that point of surrender where I went, this has got to change and I was willing to go to any lengths to change it. Because he hasn't gotten over it and neither of us have repartnered and he um, goes through. I'm unfortunately still a little bit based on how he's feeling so if he's in if he's angry and very short with me when we do drop-offs and pickups I pick that up. I think rather than feeling um, unhappy with the agreement we've got now I, I'm dealing with and, and working with what I've got rather than holding any um, any grudge about what's happened in that agreement. It refocused my attention back on what was important which was the children and in my resentment I had become the priority, I had become absorbed in the dispute. The best thing and the most important thing about um, finding anger care as a resource is to be able to give yourself permission to put aside all of that anger and resentment and to put aside all of those personal frustrations and fears and just focus very much on the welfare of the child and what they're going through and putting yourself in a position where you're able to best support her or support them through that process. It takes a while to set up the different houses and the rooms and once all of that had been set up and there was a routine set up with a shared care, um, they were able to sort of, I guess, feel normal again in a sense as much as they can in the circumstances. The kids are our first priority, you know, they need to go from one house to another house in a safety bubble. Really important to, to let go of the, the, um, the anger and the attack that you've felt and really concentrate on what's important for the kids. Having done the kids our first program when I was interacting with their dad and I had this point where I had a choice between feeling powerful or being loving and I chose being loving which was such a gift because I started to treat him with respect which I hadn't done before and he responded in kind and we both started to um, I don't know honor each other. The program normalized um, the separation for me um, and that helped me to normalise it for uh, my children as well. It gives you so many tools to deal with children that are going through a breakdown of marriage. It puts it in their eyes. It gives you the tools to understand what you do and say through the breakdown of marriage right through to you know the divorce and all the rest of it um, that that they'll hopefully come through the other end as at least as a balanced ch uh, child and balanced adult. To put all that aside and to put our daughter first and to say look we need we're in this room together we need to discuss either schooling or friends or um, custody issues, we need to put her first and I think that's what both of us, were at the, I think we both had that same common goal was to actually put her, for, um, put her first, we have to basically offload our baggage, 
and actually try and move forward and, and get and, and do the right thing by her. And I think she's benefited. It's it's been great. I think she has I think she's got the personality as well, but I think having two parents who can be in the same room together, or two ex-parents, well no, they're still her parents, we're still her parents, but two parents in the same room who we can go to school functions, uh, maybe sit down and discuss or have a coffee or something, we're still we're very um, amicable, um, and I think that is just wonderful. webinar we will be talking quite a bit about conflict so what is conflict it's an active disagreement between people with opposing opinions or principles the thing to recognize about conflict is that it is normal that it can be resolved that it is a part of every relationship and very importantly it is not the same as viable very, very important, and I cannot stress that strongly enough. And conflict at times can offer opportunities for parents to resolve issues, um, provided that they can have robust conversations and remain respectful towards each other. Uh, it quite often leads to solutions. So, but what is problematic, however, is something that we'll go along and talk about. So family violence, I'd like to acknowledge the difference now between conflict and family violence. You'll see this uh, diagram we have here, the wheel-like picture. That's known as the Duluth Wheel of Power and Control. And that does provide us with some examples of behaviours that are considered to be family violence. So at the point of separation, some families do report an increase in incidences of family violence. For others, however, this has been an ongoing thing throughout their childhood and throughout their family relationship. And if anybody wishes to explore um, the issue of family violence more, please do not hesitate to contact your practitioner. That's what we're here to do, we're here to help. You'll see a, a little note there that says resource. And this is the National Legal Aid's Family Violence Law Help website. And it's a, a great resource because it quite often can give you assistance in um, things such as uh, domestic and family violence, uh, domestic violence orders, family law, child protection matters, and the different support services that are available. And this particular uh, resource can be translated into different languages if that is required. And here in our local areas, where there are some great services available to support you um, and um, to work with people who are perpetrators of family violence, as well as those who have had it uh, placed upon. So the effect of family violence on children. So the Family Law Act considers family violence to be when children witness any aspect of violence against another person, in particular, when it's against the other uh, parent, and when there's constant arguing, yelling, and threats made with whenever the children are present. So family violence impacts the children's well-being, their sense of self, and threatens their, their feelings of safety and security. So the next three slides give you some information from a well-known child psychologist called Jennifer McIntosh. She's completed a lot of research around family separation and on the impacts of high and ongoing conflict on children. So what does high conflict look like? Well, parents remain very angry. They distrust each other. They become verbally abusive. They avoid each other unnecessarily. 
Um, a lot of parents say, you know, we're not talking to each other, so there's no conflict. Or well, not talking to each other is, is a form of conflict, especially in the children's eyes. They argue and interfere a lot, go to court a lot. Court can be um, very adversarial and, and can just continue the conflict. They, they display threatening, intimidating or controlling behaviour. They're aggressive or violent. And they have trouble communicating about the children and they can criticise each other's parenting. And if parents can't communicate about their children, you know, where, where does that leave the children? So this slide shows how high and ongoing conflict can impact on children. The Jennifer McIntosh research suggests that it's not so much the separation that impacts on the children, it's the ongoing conflict and tension between parents that, that has been consistently shown to, to have a negative impact on children's adjustment after separation. And young children and infants find such conflict and tension to be especially distressing because it's occurring between the people they rely on for just about everything. In our experience in working with children, you know, they always express that they just want the conflict to stop. They want mum and dad to be able to talk to each other and be nice. So the good news is that, that you can protect your children. And one of the most tangible things that your children can see and feel is your communication. So keep your conflict away from your children. Listen carefully to how they feel about things. You don't have to have all the answers. Just as long as they're being heard. And you're also keeping that, that conversation open. Let them know that you're trying to sort out your differences. So they feel safe, they know that mum and dad have got this, they're working it out. Explain that it's not your child's fault. Children often think it was their fault that the parents separated in the first place, or that all that's their fault that there's ongoing conflict. And be positive about the other parent. You know, that can be really hard to do sometimes, but how you see the other parent, you know, may not be how your child sees them. So it's saying little positive things such as, you know, your dad does your hair really nice, or Mummy's really good at helping you with your homework. Just little things like that are, are really nice for children to hear and, and they need to hear that. And if you focus on the negative things that your children say about their time with the other parent, they will eventually only tell you about the negative things. So where you can, you know, don't let your children get caught in the middle. Don't let them play messenger. And don't let them take sides. And when we see parents beginning to just to work together and to, and to focus on their children, they'll often tell us that as a result of this, they're seeing positive changes in their children, in their behaviour and in their wellbeing. Following on from what Nicole just said then around communication, I'd like to stress that it's an extremely important part of co-parenting. But a really important thing to realise that Contrary to what a lot of people think, communication is not just talking. It's equally important to use these things, your ears, as what it is to use your mouth. So it's really important uh, to hear what the other person has to say, what their perspective on parenting arrangements are. Um, that's just as every bit as important as what your views are. So when you're looking at making arrangements for your children, um, have a really good think about how, how you and your ex-partner communicate, um, think about what your child is hearing, um, what are they seeing and most importantly what needs to change. You know, I quite often say to my clients go and have a really good look in the mirror and think about what you're doing and think about what your kids are hearing and seeing. What message are you sending your kids? And remember that we communicate not just with our words that it's our tone of our voice and our body language and things like that that all make up part of the message to go between you and the other parent. So some strategies around communication. It's really helpful if you're having trouble communicating to uh, communicate in writing. Uh, quite often parents use a communication book to pass backwards and forwards. Uh, of late, more and more uh, parents are using parenting apps and they seem to be working really, really well for a lot of families. So certainly uh, investigate those. They're a great uh, uh, tool for you to have. Clarify what you're, you're saying. 
because particularly when we send a text message or an email to somebody, you know, they're only getting the words. So they don't always get the whole meaning of what you're saying. They're missing the body language and the tone that we spoke about before. So, you know, clarify what, what your message is and always work on solutions. Make that your priority, not what's gone wrong in the past and, you know, where, where things have, you know, fallen off the rails. You know, be very future focused wherever possible and always look at what can we do? What solution can we find? Maintain a respectful attitude towards each other. You know, that can be difficult at times, but, you know, this other person is the father or the mother of your children. So conduct yourself in a respectful way and your children will pick up on that. And I cannot underestimate and stress too strongly the power that that has when your kids see you um, treating each other with respect and um, cooperating with each other. Whilst you're communicating, if things do get a little bit uh, tense or the temperature in the room goes up a little bit, don't be afraid to call a time out. Say, look, things aren't working really well now. Let's talk about this tomorrow night. How about I give you a call at six o'clock then and we'll finish the discussion. Um, that, that's a really good way, you know, put out the bushfire before it starts. And um, Consider putting the way you're going to communicate into your parenting arrangements because quite often if it's there in writing, it's I tell my clients it's a, a verbal, it's a written contract between you both, a moral contract. It tells you how you're going to do things. So um, having it in writing how you're going to communicate is a, is a great way of doing things. Okay, some parroting styles after separation. There's three main parroting styles. On the left, you'll see a diagram there. That's what we refer to as cooperative parents. And these are the parents that post separation seem to get along pretty well. Uh, makes up about a third of the separated parenting group. They're able to talk together, plan for their kids, make decisions together, and um, generally get along okay and um, that's the ideal situation. The picture in the middle around conflicted parents, we do unfortunately see uh, a number of families caught in this situation. Again, it makes up about a third of the separated parenting cohort. Um, this group find it a bit difficult to talk to each other, therefore it's hard to make plans and to reach decisions for their children. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to communicate generally. The third group is around parallel parenting. And for parents that have been in that conflicted state for some time, you know, they can, with a little bit of work, a little bit of assistance, can move to parallel parenting. And this is a great way to co-parent. We refer to it as a business type relationship. Um, once again, it makes up about the other third of parents that are separated. Now, this group, they may not talk to each other every day. They may not even be best of friends, but they are able to communicate, act in an amicable manner, be civil towards each other, uh, act in a respectful manner in front of the kids particularly. Um, and they're able to make plans and um, make those important decisions that we as parents have to make for our kids. And um, the result of being able to do this it just removes so much of the stress from your children. So, you know, it's something to really keep in mind. So I think most of us have heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. So children's support networks are very important to keep in mind when moving forward and making plans. So sometimes we see parents overlook the importance of these networks. It may be that, you know, they may not like a grandparent or, or a relative in particular, um, but, but your children may feel differently. And keep in mind too that your child may have formed a positive relationship with the sporting coach or dancing teacher and keep these support networks around them. They can help with their adjustment. So it's about keeping things as close to normal as possible. It can be very helpful to see family separation as a restructuring of your family and not only for you but also for your children. So help them to see that they still have a mum 
and still have a dad. They just, just live in different homes. So even though your relationship as a couple dissolves, the one aspect that cannot be dissolved is the parenting relationship that you have with one another and with your children. So it's important to focus on separating a couple issues from your parenting responsibilities and focus on your children and move forward in the best way for them. You are parents together forever. Blended families can take many forms, so family members may not all be biologically related, but this doesn't mean that they can't form close or loving bonds. So be patient. Relationships take time to build. Give your children time to adjust to these changes and, and gradually make them. And be the responsible parent. It's not your new partner's responsibility to take on the main role. This is an issue that is brought up a lot with parents that, that we work with. And focus on your, your relationship with your child and have alone time together, reassuring them of your love for them. And introduce new partners respectfully. Remember that your new partner is your choice and not necessarily theirs. And no one can replace you in your child's heart and mind. So what we're going to talk about now is the developmental ages and stages of children. Now, the needs of a, say, three-month-old baby, they're very, very different to a 15-year-old teenager. So we're, we're going to have a look now at the different needs as children grow and the, the reasons why and how important it is for parents to take um, into account that the children are growing and as they grow, their needs change. I love this, uh, this little quote on the left the flowers in the eyes and it's brain development is like building a house. The basic architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth and it continues into adult. They're always growing and they're always thinking. Now, what we're going to do in the next few, few slides is have a look at the different ages and stages of children's development. Birth to three years. I need you to tune into my needs. Make me feel secure. I depend on you. Breastfeed me. Bottle feed me. Change my wet nappy. Bathe me. Let me sleep. Hold me when I cry and reassure me that I am safe. Understand that I can't always self-soothe. Play with me. Give me predictable routines. Don't overwhelm me with too much change or expose me to parental conflict. Nurture me. Cuddle me. Love me. Help me to form strong attachments. My development depends on you. Four to eight years. I can show my grief through my behaviour. Ask me how I feel. Reassure me that I'm not to blame for the separation. Support me or make others aware that I need help at this time. Sometimes I wish you'd get back together. I might play you off against each other. I might not tell you the truth because it's easier to tell you what you want to hear. Going between houses can be hard sometimes. I just don't want to go. I need boundaries and rules and I need you to be predictable parents. Please don't fight in front of me. Nine to 12 years. I am maturing. My friends, sport and activities are important to me. I can tell you how I feel. I sometimes feel angry about the separation and the changes imposed on me. Don't put me in the middle of separation conflict. I might just choose to align with one parent if the fighting doesn't stop. I'm going through emotional and physical changes and I need a safe and secure place to evolve. Consider my needs. Thirteen to eighteen years. I need my flexibility to plan my life. I like my possessions. I might not want to turn transition between homes. My friends are important to me. I have a good sense of right and wrong. Don't make me play messenger if you can't communicate. I need my parents who are adults. My mental health is important. The separation stress can affect me. Keep talking to me even if I don't always answer. So let's have a look at some family law information now. So you'll hear the term best interests of the child quite frequently. And the primary considerations under family law that, uh, that we look at is 
the benefit of the child to have a meaningful relationship with both parents, but also the need to protect children from physical or psychological harm, abuse, neglect, or family violence. And where there is a, a conflict between these two things, safety will always win out. It trumps uh, the need to have a relationship with the other parent. Kids must be kept safe. So what we're going to do now is um, move on and have a, a look at a, a video put together by the Yoon Riverina Community Legal Service. Alison is the lawyer that's presenting this and um, she will provide us with some great information. Alison's a very, very experienced family. There are many common myths that float around in the community. One of the common myths is, if I leave, will I get to see my children? Guilt has no place in the Family Law Act anymore. Children have the right to spend time with each of their parents. Whoever left the relationship, it really doesn't matter. Sometimes we hear parents say, I'm going to get my day in court. As a lawyer, I can tell parents that court isn't that much fun. There is some stress, there is some delay, and there is some anxiety attached to going to court. If you can work out your parenting issues by going through mediation or through another type of family dispute resolution, please do this, give it your best shot. Another common myth is when I hear parents say, I'm not paying child support, therefore I won't be seeing the children. Those two things are totally different. Parents have a legal obligation to support their children. A child support assessment may be put into place. Children do have the right to spend meaningful time with their parents and to have meaningful relationships with both parents. Child support is just one of those issues that the court may take into account when considering best interests of the children. Another common myth is when parents say, we have equal shared parental responsibility. This means 50-50 with each parent. We can tell those parents that that is not the way it works. When there is an equal shared parental responsibility put into place or presumed by the law, what this means is that consideration must be given to whether it is appropriate for children to spend equal time with both parents, what is in those children's best interests and what is reasonably practical. Sometimes we are asked, my child is 14, does this mean that that child can make their own decisions? The Family Law Act says that children's ages and views must be taken into account. However, there is no magic age where a child simply determines what they can do. The terms custody and access have gone out the window. The Family Law Act now talks about children spending time with a parent or living with a parent. Children are not property and they shouldn't be treated as property. The Act is not gender based. It doesn't matter if you are the mother or the father or another significant person. What the Family Law Act cares about is that the best interests of the children are taken into account. Parents sometimes come to see me and they say, I have a right to do this. I have a right that that child live with me. Sorry, parents, you don't have the rights. You have the responsibilities. Children have all the rights. As parents, you have the responsibilities. The law says that children have all the rights and parents have the responsibilities. Children have the right to have a meaningful relationship with both parents. They also have the right to be safe and to be kept safe. It is really important that the children's welfare is taken into account and that all decisions are made in the best interests of the children. So Nicole and I are now going to give you some information around the Family Relationship Services programs. All of our practitioners will screen for family violence, mental health, child abuse, drug and alcohol misuse. And we use this information to make decisions about the the best and most appropriate way for us to deliver service to your family and also to link you in with other services through our referral network. UMFC's Family Relationship Services includes the Family Relationship Centre, the Children's Contact Centre and the Parenting Orders Program. So parties may attend voluntary or be court ordered to engage in all the programs depending on their situation. All of our work is focused on the children um, for example, how they may be impacted and how they may be coping. The Family Relationship Centre is located in Wodonga. They offer mediation for children as well as property matters. 
Mediation is an opportunity for parents or significant others to come up with their own parenting agreement. The Family Relationships Service Centre also provides an opportunity for children to talk to a qualified child consultant. So this is done in a way that explores how children are coping, um, just exploring their thoughts and their feelings after separation. So it's not counselling. Child consultants facilitate conversations and dialogues with school aged children and adolescents in a relaxed and informal manner, so using a variety of tools such as cards, books and, and art. Both parents need to agree for this to happen and the child consultant must also consider it to be appropriate. And feedback that the children have consented to will be shared with the parents. So the Children's Contact Centre is a purpose built facility located in Albury. So the program allows children to establish or maintain a relationship with a parent or significant person through supervised contacts or changeovers. In a supervised contact, the child spends time with the parent or significant person on site in our playroom and it's in the presence of a worker. So changeovers allow the child to go from the care of one party to the other safely without the party seeing each other. Observational notes are taken for court purposes in this program. And the Parenting Orders Program, which I'll talk to you about next, um, provides family counselling to families engaged in supervised contacts. So the Parenting Orders Program is lo also located in Aubrey. So the program offers therapeutic interventions tailored to the needs of families who have experienced separation. So the goal of the program is to assist parents to improve the co-parenting relationship, address their differences and focus on the best interests of their children. This is done through post-separation counselling, which can be individual, joint or family group, and a six-week adult group work called Building Better Bridges, which is very similar to the Kids at First program that we saw in the video earlier. So the Building Better Bridges program covers a range of topics, including conflict resolution, communication, and child development, and it runs each school term. Ideally, both parents attend the group, but they would not be in the same group. We also have a children's program called Jigsaw, for children aged 6 to 11. It's a fun activity-based program which helps to normalise separation for children and covers topics such as adjusting to change, problem solving, recognising and managing emotions. And the program runs each school term for five weeks. So at the end of the program, parents attend a session with the Jigsaw facilitator to receive some feedback about their children and, and their time in the program. So please speak to your practitioner if you're interested in engaging in another program. So we're going to, to look at now at another video. This one was published by the Australian Institute of Family Studies and in, includes a number of quotes from children and young people. And it talks about their experiences in, within the family law system. I was like, what's the point of telling her if she's not going to listen? She spoke down to me like, because I was a child and my views didn't matter. It felt like I was being not so much attacked or pressured, but you know what they're like. Do you really think that? Like, is that what you really believe? Is that a real reason though? I didn't really seek help, I guess. I basically chucked on a thick skin and acted tough and yeah, sort of dealt with it on my own. If I had a meeting with one of them and they just kind of talked me through what I could do and what they were doing, that could have been quite useful. I sometimes find it hard because in the court process I was like introduced to a lot of different people. I feel like that's what they do. They build my trust. I'm like, okay, cool, this is going to be cool. And then they basically just blow it out the window. They don't listen. They're just kind of like, uh, the parents, the parents' decision. The children have no say whatsoever. Just look into the reports that have been done before, or even the police reports, and like, not just push them aside, actually look at them and be like, is this safe? I think they could have organised like a whole family session so we could all be part of it, because it does involve me as a kind of one of the possessions of the two parents. I wish I've had a bit more say in it, because that's ultimately what it's about, I guess. Uh, something that helped me 
out through it was my dad. Um, he kept me informed with things that would have been affecting me. And things like that, even though they're small, um, they're very helpful. I feel like it, it definitely exposed a lot of things that we wouldn't have talked about otherwise. And I think that it strengthened my relationship with my brothers and probably with our mum. Just listen and go through with things you say you're going to do. So if you say you're going to help them, help them. If you say, okay, if you want me to stop, we'll stop. Just stop. And you've really got to build that trust. I feel like that could be a really good idea to help educate kids. Some kids may feel bad about the fact that their parents are split up and they, they should know that it isn't their fault. It's never the kid's fault. We're going to talk now about developing parenting arrangements for your children. This is always a little bit difficult because what we aim for is what is in the best interest of your children. But it also sometimes we have to balance it up with what's workable and practicable for our parents. So the sorts of things that you, you really helpful to look at is, you know, have a think about your, your child's uh, temperament, um, how resilient they are, um, their ages and stages of development that we spoke about earlier on. And nobody knows your children like you. So Think about their needs and what's going to work best for them. So let's, let's have a look at some fairly typical things that get discussed in our mediation sessions and uh, with our counsellors. Um, when parents are looking at developing their parenting arrangements, probably the most common one is the time that the children spend with their, their parents. So the time that the children have with their, their parents, but also, also uh, you know, grandparents, aunts, uncles, all their extended family. Uh, because, you know, quite often after separation, very important and very loved people that the children have, have had in their family just get cut out of the kids' lives. And it's a really difficult thing for children. So it's, you know, we, we encourage parents to take that into consideration not the relationship that you have with the other adults, but the relationship your child has with the other adults. Things such as uh, school holidays, making arrangements around that so the children can have some holiday and recreational time with uh, both their parents. Um, special occasions, uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Easter, Christmas, all, all those birthdays, all, all those really important things. That, um, that we need to make arrangements around. Decision making is another important thing. Now, when parents were still a couple, they had to make a lot of decisions about their children. They'd quite often sit around the dinner table at night and, and you know, talk about these things. Well, all those decisions, they still have to be made. They don't go away after separation. So, We've got a few examples there, you know, um, quite often parents have very different religious views. Um, making arrangements for schooling or, or daycare, you know, you've got children transitioning from um, primary school into high school, what high school are they going to go to? You know, that, that really needs to be made jointly for, by both parents. Um, extracurricular activities. In this day and age, kids seem to be so involved in so many different sports and different things. So working out, um, you know, what the, the children are going to do as far as activities and also, you know, how they're going to get there. Is it is it practicable for, for children to attend all those activities? And, uh, you know, are the parents able to take them there or make arrangements for the children to, to attend? And if the children play football or soccer or netball, you know, can, can both parents attend? That's a really great thing if you can both make it to their sporting matches. Kids would really love that. Um, financial support, you know, children aren't inexpensive things, that's for sure. Uh, set of braces for a child's teeth, you know, like an eight to $10,000. So how these, uh, you know, sharing of the cost to children and, and raising them, and that's quite often a, a decision that needs to be made and gets put into parenting plans. And likewise with the costs around 
the medical needs of children and also the decisions around um, medical procedures. A few other things, very importantly, communicate. How are you going to communicate? And um, the different cultural beliefs. Um, families frequently come from different cultural backgrounds and post-separation, um, they have different views on how things will be done. Flexibility, it's really helpful if you have a bit of flexibility and have some give and take. You know, don't be rigid. If, if uh, Uncle Colin's wedding's coming up um, at a time when they're due to be with one parent, and you know, let, let them go. So yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's really important that they go to their their uncle's wedding. It's not about whether they're due to be with you on that weekend or not. Um, sharing of information. There's lots and lots of things goes on in kids' lives. Uh, their schooling health, all those sorts of things, and it needs to be shared between parents. Travel, you know, people after COVID-19 is done and dusted, hopefully, people will be able to travel again, and um, you know, that's something that you may want to talk about during your mediation sessions and um, arranging holidays for you, with you and your children. So um, Wayne made some, some really important points there and, and some important messages that, that we hope you, you take away from this webinar. Uh, always think about what is best for your child, is what I need, what my child needs. Be a respectful co-parent. Separate from being a former partner to a respectful co-parent. Be supportive. You can make a difference to how your child manages the separation. And find, if you can, you know, effective ways to communicate with the other parent. Your child needs to know that you can coordinate and cooperate and that they are safe. And wherever you can, avoid conflict. And you can change your own behaviour and reactions to others. You can't change your, your ex-partner's behaviour or, or um, what happens in, in their home when the children are with them. So move your focus away from being in conflict with the other parent. And most importantly, you know, focus on your child. Prioritise having a healthy relationship with your children. I think this is a, a lovely piece of information. So when we look at where do we go from here, it, it only takes one person to make change possible for your family. So be that person for your child. So Nicole and I would like to thank everybody for watching this webinar. And uh, we hope that when you go on and uh, if, through our services, with our family counselling, our children's contact centre, family uh, relationship centre, we hope that you get a great outcome and are able to go on and co-parent very successfully and your children grow and thrive. Thank you very much.